Excellent. Uh, so uh, sometimes don't need a microphone, but uh, uh, why not? Can't hurt, I suppose. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, are you everyone well? Uh, everyone good? Okay. Nice to see you all again. Uh, and uh, I thought today I'm going to give a talk very similar to a talk I gave in Perth just a few days ago, about last week or something like that, uh, because uh, people seem to like it. Uh, I don't know if you, any of you listen to those talks. If you do, you're going to have to hear it again. Otherwise, you, it will be more fresh for you. Uh, but this is going to be a talk on the idea of identity. Uh, in other words, uh, who we take ourselves to be, uh, what we are as human beings, uh, and how we can think about that and how we should deal with that so as not to make, us, uh, make it problematic for us. Uh, and uh, it, this came about because about a week, no, not a week ago, now it is about three weeks ago, I became an Aussie. So I'm now an Australian citizen. Yeah? Before that, I've lived in Australia for 25 years, uh, but I, was very, I wasn't really ready to become an Australian yet. Uh, it took a long time. Uh, but uh, then one day I decided, okay, I better become an Australian citizen because it's more safe if you are a citizen. Yeah? They can't really kick you out of the country and that sort of thing. Yeah? So I thought I better become a, an Australian. Yeah? So I went to this ceremony. It was a very nice ceremony, very Australian, very relaxed. Yeah? Very kind of, oh yeah, everything is okay. Yeah? No worries. Yeah? And this kind of thing. Yeah? And uh, so very nice. But then I thought to myself, uh, am I really Australian? Yeah? I lived in Australia for 25 years. Uh, do I feel like an Australian? Uh, not really. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's, there wasn't really any kind of, for me, it was like, whatever, it doesn't really matter if I'm Australian or whatever I am. Uh, so I started to think, how do I know what my nationality or my identity is? Uh, yeah, if I don't feel like an Australian, what, what do I feel like? I was born in Norway, so maybe I'm more Norwegian, am I more Norwegian, more Aussie? I come to Malaysia every year, maybe I'm coming slightly Malaysian after a while. Huh? Yeah, I go to Singapore a lot. Maybe. See, after a while you become this mix of all these identities. Huh? So I ask myself, what, what am I? Huh? And one of the ways of finding out what you are, huh? you know what that is? Huh? Is to ask yourself, what sports team do you support? Yeah? Huh? As soon as you ask yourself the sports team, you know exactly where your identity is. Huh? And I knew that if a Norwegian kind of sports person does really well, I think, yay, no way, yeah, doing really well. If, if Australia wins in the cricket or the rugby or whatever, I don't feel anything here. It doesn't, any, doesn't do anything for me. Yeah? Then I knew, okay, I must still have some Norwegian identity yeah, because I kind of really support in the Norwegian sports person. Yeah. And it's often like that. If you ask yourself what sports people you support, yeah, you have some idea what your identity is like. Yeah. But then I... I thought about that and I felt very uncomfortable with the idea of supporting a Norwegian team or a Norwegian sports person uh, because I felt it was very like it's narrowing, narrowing yourself down, uh, yeah, narrowing yourself down to supporting some people and all those people who are not part of that group, part of that Norwegian team, uh, they are outsider. Uh, yeah, it's like you are blocking yourself off from the vast majority of humanity uh, and you're supporting as a tiny group. Uh, and of course, as soon as you support somebody, it's like the other people, you don't care about them. Uh, yeah, if, you, if a Norwegian person wins, but then some other person loses, uh, the other t all the other people who are supporting the other person, they're going to feel really disappointed. You don't care what they feel. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, you don't care about what the losing team feels at all. So it's like you create this world of us and them. Uh, we are better, we are more important, yeah, who cares about all the other ones? Uh, and you're closing off your heart, you're closing off your ability to have a sense of meta and compassion for the world at large. You're narrowing yourself down to this tiny group of people, tiny group of beings. Uh, so I started to feel really uncomfortable. Am I, I've been a monk for 25 years. Uh, I still have this nationalist feeling, uh, this kind of, yay, Norway, yeah? That's bad. What have, have I been doing for 25 years? Uh, I've got to get my act together. <laughs> So, I, so this kind of started that this uh, uh, idea of identity and I thought I'd better talk about this because this actually is quite interesting. Uh, and straight away when I saw this I understand there is a problem here. As far as sports is concerned it's a very minor matter. Yeah, you don't really feel too bad about supporting a sports team. Uh, but you can see that that is the root of all nationalism, is the all root of distinguish, distinguishing between myself, my people, and other people. It's a root 
for discriminating against others, uh, for having the people on the inside and the people on the outside, uh, and we separate humanity in this way. Uh, and I thought this is very problematic. Uh, this is something that really is worthwhile talking about. And of course, uh, it is a very Buddhist thing, the idea of identity. It's something we talk about in Buddhism, uh, because it has to do with the sense of self, uh, has to do with this idea of atta and anatta and all of these things. Uh, so for that reason, it's actually very important. Uh, and when you go to the suttas, uh, yeah, I always talk about the suttas, uh, yeah, the word of the Buddha. When you go to the word of the Buddha, what you find is that the Buddha also talks about conflict in humanity between beings. Uh, and he analyzes the idea of conflict. Yeah, if you look at the world, there's always so much conflict in the world. Uh, problems going on everywhere. And uh, why is there all this conflict? Uh, this is actually a conversation. This is a famous sutta called the, uh, called the Sakka Panya Sutta. Sakka is the god of the kind of one of the heavenly realms. Panya is the question. So these are the questions of Sakka. And Sakka comes down to the Buddha and he asks these very beautiful and profound questions of the Buddha. Huh? And he says uh, to the Buddha, he says, Why is it uh, that although all beings, all human beings, we want to live in peace. We want to live in harmony. But even though we want to live like that, still we fight. Still we have conflict. Still we have wars. Still we have all these problems. Why is that? Why is it this kind of clash between what we want deep down and how we actually live? And so the Buddha analyzes this problem. And he brings it back step by step, looking for the causes and the reasons for why we have conflict in the world uh, and he brings it back to one point uh, and there's one thing that is the cause of all of these things uh, and that is uh, surprise surprise uh, craving craving is the cause of pretty much all bad things in buddhism yeah and craving is also the cause of the conflicts that we have in society uh, and there's two kinds of craving that the buddha talks about two main cravings that you find in the uh, things like the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, which we are looking at now in the um, uh, little retreat we're having upstairs. Uh, and uh, in that sutta, he talks about three kinds of craving. There's two kinds of craving in particular that are important. And one is the craving for the sensual world. Yeah, the sensual pleasures is one of the cravings. Uh, and the other very important craving is the craving for existence. Uh, yeah? Do you like to exist? Yeah, okay, so craving for existence. Yeah, you want to exist. Most people want to exist. If you don't want to exist, well, maybe it's because you are an arahant. Yeah, but usually if you ask in the crowd how many arahants, usually not so many. Yeah. So usually people crave to exist. Uh. So these two cravings, uh, yeah, so both of these cravings are a cause and a source for the disharmony and the problems that we have in society. Wars, yeah, all of these things that come from these two kinds of craving. Yeah. So let us very quickly just have a look at the craving for sensual pleasures before I move on to the craving for existence. Uh. So craving for sensual pleasures, why is that problematic? Yeah. And the reason why it is problematic is because in the world we only have so many resources. Uh, the cake, yeah, the kind of, you know, the proverbial cake when you go, you know, you see a kind of a statist a chart, yeah, it's often kind of a pie chart, and they have a cake, like a pie, and then they have slices in the pie, yeah? The cake is only so large, it means everyone, everyone's slice can only be so large. Uh, if everyone wants an infinite slice, which Really, that's what craving says, you want an infinite slice, the pie has to be infinite large, the economy has to be infinite. Can the economy be infinite? No, impossible. Yeah, we on only have so many resources. So, because uh, there is a limit to resources in the world, uh, there's a limit to everything we want. Everyone wants a larger house, everyone wants a better car, everyone wants the best possible relationship, everyone wants everything uh, and for that reason we tend to have conflict in society uh. and the buddha has a very beautiful simile to describe this uh. it's one of my favorite similes in the suttas uh. and the buddha says it's as if a bird a bird gets hold of a nice piece of meat uh. yeah very hard for birds to get hold of nice pieces of meat usually they have to eat worms uh. yeah a nice piece of meat is very rare in the bird world uh. bird loka loka is world in pali Bird is like sakuna, sakuna loka. That's a new word. 
Yeah, <laughs> that, that word doesn't exist in the suttas. But sakuna loka, if that word existed, would mean the, wor the world of the birds. So in the world of the birds, very hard to get hold of a nice piece of meat. Yeah, maybe there was a butcher or something that took compassion on this bird, so it threw it a nice piece of meat. And the bird thinks, yay, nice piece of meat. But as soon as that bird thinks, yay, nice piece of meat, and flies off with it, uh, other birds want exactly the same piece of meat. It's rare to find a nice piece of meat in the world of birds. Uh, so as soon as this bird flies off, all these other birds chase the first bird. Uh, they go after it. Uh, yeah, and they kind of try to grab hold of that meat, uh, grabbing it in its claws or grabbing it in its beak, wherever it is. Uh, and because these other birds are many more, uh, and because often these other birds are larger than the original bird, uh, it's very dangerous for that first bird. Uh, if it isn't careful, it's going to die or it's going to be very badly injured. Uh, and the reason is because everyone wants that piece of meat. Uh, that piece of meat is like a simile for the sensual pleasures in the world. Everybody wants more. You're always fighting over things. You're always uh, rival rivals in the world of sensual pleasures. We tend to like the same people. Yeah? We want the same partners in life. If you look at all the glossy magazines, yeah, the reason why some of these people are on in the glossy magazines is because everyone likes these people. Yeah, some movie star or whatever. Wow, this movie star, so beautiful or so handsome. Everyone kind of likes the same people. So we tend to gravitate towards uh, these things. Uh, and then they have rivalry. Uh, we have um, all kinds of problems ari arising from that. Uh. And sometimes it is actually very painful and very difficult because even when you do find a nice partner in life, uh, finally you may settle down with a nice partner, maybe you get married, maybe you don't. Uh, these days people don't seem to get married so much anymore, at least where I come from, I'm not sure about Malaysia. But uh, people just live together or yeah, whatever, it doesn't, don't need, no need to get married. Uh, that's kind of the idea in Norway anyway. Uh. Fair enough. <laughs> but. Um, so, but even once you have a nice partner, once you are married to someone, uh, the problem then is you get jealous. Yeah, because still other people might be interested in that partner. Uh, and if that partner looks at the wrong person in the wrong way, straight away, jealousy can arise. Yeah, and then we, we get become possessive of this partner uh, because we don't want to let go of them. And then we have the dukkha, the suffering of that possessiveness uh, or trying to control the other person because it is so problematic. Yeah? So this is just, our life is full of this. Then we work, and when we work, we are competing at work to be the best performer in the best way, to get the salary increase or to get the promotion at work. Uh, then as children, we compete over the toys. When our parents die, we compete over the inheritance. Oh, so much competition of these things. Uh, and there is never going to be enough. Uh, and why is there never going to be? Uh, there's actually going to be enough, but never going to be enough to satisfy craving, because craving is endless. And that is the problem with samsaric existence. Uh. So this is the first cause of conflict, the, the craving for sensual desires. Uh. And if you look around the world, a lot of the wars in the world and the conflicts in the world, uh, they come from this kind of craving. Uh. The desire to control resources. Uh, yeah? You want to control the oil in the Middle East, like, you know, the, like Americans invading the Middle East, because when you control resources, you also control your ability of your economy to grow. And then, of course, in that way, to provide sensual satisfaction to all your citizens. Uh. So, so much comes from this. Uh. But what I really want to talk about today is not sensual pleasures, uh, but identity. Uh, yeah? So the other thing that Buddha talks about uh, is the craving for existence. Uh, and that craving for existence is very similar to the idea of identity. Uh, because when you crave to exist, uh, you also want to crave, you want to exist in a certain way. Uh, yeah? That existence has to take a certain shape, a certain form. And that shape and form that existence take, that is precisely your identity, who you are as a person. Uh, so this is the other thing. Uh, and this is why uh, when we feel that our identity, who we are, is challenged by the world around us, uh, we feel insecure, we feel uncomfortable, and it leads to enormous problems in society. Uh. And I just want to point out to you some of these problems that come from the idea of identity, because they are really massive, large-scale social problems. And this is just to point out the kind of the um, beauty of moving away from this. Uh, one of the 
kind of some of the really great conflicts in the world that have been going on for a long time. Uh, one of those conflicts that you may be aware of is the conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland conflict. Uh, yeah, not this conflict here. There's a small, small one. Uh, Northern Ireland conflict, yeah, where you have the, uh, I you have the um, Irish, yeah, and the people who are siding with the British, yeah, they called the Protestants and the Anglicans, yeah, sorry, the Protestants and the Catholics. And that conflict has been going on in Northern Ireland pretty much for about a hundred years, probably even longer, but a hundred years is like the right latest kind of iteration of that conflict. And if you look at that conflict, it is based purely on the idea of religious adherence. On the one side you have the Catholics, on the other side you have the Anglicans and the Protestants, and their nationalism, their identity is so strong, yeah, that they have been fighting each other for almost a hundred years. And uh, actually, it only probably really started really badly after that. It only started maybe in the 1970s really badly. Uh, and in that period, uh, they, I was reading an article recently about the conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, they have been killing each other. Three and a half thousand people have been killed. Uh, and the population of Northern Ireland is only about one and a half million people. Uh, one and a half million is like how many people in KL? Many more, yeah? So it's like a tiny portion of KL, kind of, yeah? And three and a half thousand people killed. It's like in your, in your neighborhood in KL, as if three and a half thousand people were killed in that neighborhood. Uh, and 50,000 wounded on top of that, uh, yeah? So it's a terrible conflict uh, and so hard to resolve, uh, so difficult to really get these people to meet and see eye to eye and give up their animosity here. Uh. And from a Buddhist point of view, you, we don't even know the difference between Catholics and Protestants. Uh. You know the difference? Uh. It's, it's same God, the same scriptures, yeah, same kind of worship. The difference is so tiny. And still, they kind of argue like this. Uh. And this is one, I think, one of the fascinating things about humanity, is that if you look at the, where the biggest arguments are, often the biggest arguments uh, are with the people who are closest to you. Uh. Yeah, in, uh, in like if you are a Theravadan Buddhist, you don't uh, argue so much with the Mahayanas because the Mahayanas, yeah, okay, that's too far away anyway. But you argue with your Theravadans that have a slightly different view, yeah? You have the kind of Vipassana Theravadans and the, and the Samadhi Theravadans. Yeah, that's where the arguments really are very strong, yeah? <laughs> And the reason for that is because this is where your identity is like the strongest, yeah, in these small little things. Really, this is what really matters to you. This is what really is important. Uh, so often the people who are closest to us uh, are the people we argue the most with. Uh, and this is a problem, a very, very big problem in the world. Uh. So, uh, I, uh, so it is sad, in a sense, to see this happening. And all comes from one thing, identity. I identify as a Catholic, you are a Protestant, therefore you are my enemy. That's how it works. Another classical example of identity crisis is the conflict in the Middle East, yeah, where you have the Jews in Israel and then you have all the Arabs around it. And that is a conflict that has been going on for 3,000 years. Something like that, 3,000 years, yeah, imagine, same kind of conflict going on, yeah. And uh, again, because Jewish identity is a very strong identity, and one of the reasons why it is so strong is because they have been persecuted for so long, they've been going through so many troubles and difficulties, and because of that you create a sense of community, yeah, to defend yourself against all the people who persecute you. So Jewish identity is very strong, and the downside of having a strong identity is that you feel special. And the moment you feel special, everyone else is different. And then you get these clashes coming from that strong identity. So it's weird, isn't it? On the one hand, you protect yourself by moving to a stronger identity. And then that stronger identity, in turn, leads to more clashes and more problems as a consequence. Yeah, it is a very serious problem. problem. And uh, so... I am not suggesting that we should try to resolve the conflict in the Middle East because I think that is very hard to resolve and you could say that, well, you, you just need to reduce your identity a little bit, but in reality people aren't really going to do that. Yeah? It's very, very hard to do. My main point is only to show that this is a problem and so at least we as individual Buddhists, we can take that on board and maybe do something about it. But it's not just outside of Buddhism, that these things are a problem. Uh, these things are a problem within Buddhism as well. Uh, 
Yeah, you, if you look at the problems that we have seen in uh, places like Myanmar, in Burma, over a long period of time with the Rohingyas and the Burmese nationalists, uh, that also is a problem of identity. Uh. Yeah, when you see Buddhists, these are good Buddhists, even monastics, and they are talking down and they're talking badly about the Rohingya, saying bad things. Why are they saying that? Uh, and if you listen to what they say, it is all nationalist arguments. Uh, yeah, it's about the Rohingyas destroying the Buddhist culture. And because they destroy the Buddhist culture, we have to defend ourselves by kicking the Rohingyas out of our country here. And what you, so what these Buddhists are doing, they're doing exactly the same mistake as we're doing in Northern Ireland. We're saying us against them because this is our national identity and we have to somehow support this national identity here. We're making a problem out of uh, something which actually is not really a problem to begin with. Uh, yeah, it's not really a problem. It is the wrong way to defend Buddhism, to kind of to go out there and make someone else guilty at destroying, Buddhist, uh, uh, destroying Buddhism. Uh, what you're doing, you're saying, this is my identity. I'm holding on, I'm clinging on to this identity. You are now uh, a, a, my enemy because you are somehow making that my identity feel endangered. Uh, and that is what is going on there. Uh, but that is not really the right way of having a Buddhist identity. Uh, if we have a Buddhist identity in this way, uh, we are being just as silly as everyone else in the world. Uh, it's the wrong way to thinking, of thinking about this. Uh, and then you get these clashes of civilization in places like Burma, in Buddha, good Buddhist countries, uh, where people ideally are supposed to work together, where we're supposed to have loving kindness and compassionate understanding for each other. It doesn't matter if you are a Muslim. Uh, that doesn't make you a bad person. Uh, yeah, there are many wonderful Muslims in the world. I know Muslims who have become Buddhist. They have converted to Buddhism. That was a dangerous thing to do, I tell you. But anyway, I <laughs> but they did, yeah? And one of them wants to become a monk at a monastery. I know another, another Buddhist uh, ex-Muslim who's already a monk in Sri Lanka, yeah? And they, so, so it is just so complex, these things. And we cannot just put other people down just because they are feel feel like a threat to our sense of identity. So identity is dangerous. Uh. So this is uh, part of that. Uh. Yeah, but it goes much further. I don't, it goes even further than that. I don't know if you have heard of something. There's something now, especially coming out of America, they call identity politics. Uh. Have you heard about that? Uh. And this is the idea of politics uh, focused on the idea of identity. So let's say that you are like a small, you are a subgroup in society. Let's say that you are African Americans in the US. Yeah? This is very big in the United States. Uh, and because they say, well, historically African Americans have been kind of marginalized and discriminated against in America, we will bond together and then we will kind of together, we will push for our cause to be recognized by society. Yeah? And then more and more people do the same thing. You get all the gays, yeah, the lesbians or whatever, they also bond together because we have also been marginalized in society. And then you have maybe some of the different Asian nationalities, and then you have the women kind of with the feminist movement. And everybody bonds together yeah, in little groups in society to push their agenda. And they call it identity politics because it is your identity that decides which group you belong to her. And to some extent this is okay. Yeah, we all need sometimes to bond together to promote our you know our group or whatever. Sometimes this is okay. Yeah. But sometimes it goes too far. Yeah. And when you call it identity politics, what you are doing is, is setting up your group against other people. Yeah. And when you're setting up your group against other people, instead of promoting your well-being, yeah, what you are promoting, you're promoting violence, you're promoting a clash, you're promoting this uh, conflict between different groups in society. Uh. So when we promote, we want to promote our own group or whatever, we should apply universally valid ideas, yeah, which are valid for everyone. So instead of causing a clash, we should say we should all be treated equally. Why? Well, because we're all human beings and we deserve that from, you know, just based on ideas of basic ideas of compassion and understanding of what it is to be a human being. Yeah. That is the right way of doing things. Applying universal values that is applicable to everyone, uh, yeah, then we are kind of working together. Then we are creating harmony because we're seeing each other roughly as equal. Uh. But if we bond together and promote our identity, maybe 
while having a conflict with other identities, we are creating division, we are creating problems, and we end up with problems like the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, like a conflict in Northern Ireland, or even the conflict that you have in Burma with Buddhists, yeah, who are supposed to know better. Yeah. So these are some of the problems of identity here. Yeah. There's more problems with identity. Yeah, it's kind of endless if you start to look at it. And another problem with identity, I've so far I've mostly been talking about the idea of maybe identifying as a religion or a nationality. But of course, identity is much broader than that. We identify in so many things. We identify with our gender. We identify with our whether we are wealthy, poor, or in between. We identify with your education. Identify with our appearance, uh, yeah? you identify with uh, uh, ethnic background, uh, you identify with this, all these things, with your position in your family, uh, whatever it is, uh, there's all these things that we identify with. Uh, and you can almost make an endless number of parameters of this identity. Uh. And because sometimes we identify with these things, uh, sometimes if things go wrong in our life, uh, if there are things that challenge that sense of identity that we have, uh, you can lead to a great deal of despair for each one of us. Uh. And I don't know if you have noticed, sometimes when there is like a big economic downturn, uh, sometimes we hear about people jumping off tall buildings. Uh, and the reason why they do that is often because they have lost all their money. Uh, their identity is so caught up in that money uh, that once the money has gone it's like they feel they lose face yeah in the presence of all their peers and all the people around them uh, that they can no longer bear to live so just because you lose your money you jump off a building uh, and you die as a consequence uh, that is kind of identity taken to an extreme yeah we identify so much with your wealth uh, you cannot actually live without it uh. So the number of problems that arise from identity is a lot. And it's one of the biggest problems in the world that creates so much conflict and problems among human beings. So the question is then, what can we do about this? Yeah, this is where the Buddha, Super Buddha, comes to the rescue. Superman, or actually, maybe not man, yeah, we're making identity again. Maybe kind of super being is better to say, superhuman being. Yeah. The Buddha is really, it's true though, the Buddha really has gone beyond all of this identity business, yeah? Is, they might say that the Buddha is kind of man in a physical sense, but really, mentally, the Buddha is no longer man or woman, because he's given up the idea of identity. That's the, one of the beautiful things about the Buddha. So what does the Buddha say about this? Well, there's many things, but one of the things that to understand about the idea of identity, to understand how to overcome this, uh, is to realize it is not something you can give up just like that. Uh, you cannot say, I will, from now on, I will not have an identity anymore. Uh, have you tried that? Uh, impossible. <laughs> cannot do. Yeah, it's, there's no way. You, you have, you have some, idea, some amount of identity is just kind of programmed into us. You can't avoid that. Uh, why is that? Uh, what, what is the reason? It's, it's very important to understand this, because once you understand this, uh, you also start to understand the solution. Uh, and one of the reasons why identity is part and parcel of who we are is because of the sense of self. Uh, yeah, you feel that you exist as an individual, you feel that you exist as a part from the rest of society, and that sense of self demands, it requires a certain tags, a certain ways of existing. Uh, it uh, cannot exist in a vacuum. And that sense of self, it kind of expands into this identity. That is why we have identity, because of the sense of self. Uh, the sense of self goes into, world, into the world, and then it defines you in, co in, in contrast precisely to other people. Uh, yeah? And then your identity is established on that basis. Uh, it all comes from the sense of self. Uh, and again, because almost everybody has a sense of self, uh, except if you're an Arahant, and as I mentioned before, not so many Arahants, uh, yeah? There's one Arahant, he's over here, uh, but apart from this Arahant, not so many Arahants usually around. Uh, yeah, there may be some Arahants in the world. Do you, do you think there are any Arahants in the world? Uh, you, you think there's Arahants in the world? Okay. Which, which one do you think is in the Which Arahant? <laughs> this, this one here? Uh, <laughs> I, th I, th I agree with you, actually. I also think there are still some arrogance in the world, but they are rare. Yeah? You really have to kind of look, you have to kind of go into the jungle far away somewhere, yeah? and you have to kind of sneak up on them. Maybe you find an arrogant, but it's very, very hard to find these arrogant. So 
Because of that, identity is basically everywhere. We have to expect people to have an identity here. So once you understand that it is unavoidable, the question then is, how can we use this idea of identity in such a way as to move towards the Dhamma, to move towards more harmony, towards more peace, less conflict and aggression and war and problems in our society. That becomes really the issue here. And it is not so hard to understand what we need to do here. What we need to do, instead of identifying with all of these superficial things, we need to identify with some of the spiritual qualities. Yeah? So instead of identifying with being a Buddhist, yeah, I'm a Buddhist, these Muslims over in Rohingyas, they are really bad, yeah? So B Buddhists are the best, we are superior. Instead of thinking like that, uh, you think instead, how I identify not as a Buddhist in this way, I identify with my virtue, I identify with my morality, I identify as a kind person, as someone who is compassionate, uh, as someone who tries to understand other people, to understand where they're coming from. That is what you identify with instead. Uh. And then when you identify with that, uh, whenever you do an act of kindness, uh, whenever you do an act of generosity, uh, whenever you think a kind thought, uh, you start to feel good about yourself. Yeah, uh, And because you are uh, promoting the goodness within yourself uh, and you start to feel good about yourself, it is easy to have an identity in that area. Uh, why do we have an identity in the first place? Uh, it's because you feel good about that identity. Yeah, we tend to choose an identity that we feel good about. Uh, yeah, this is often how it is. Some of the identity is kind of given by where we are born, but also the choice. Yeah? So if you're educated, you tend to think, yeah, I'm educated. Yeah? That's really good to be educated. And then you feel a bit proud about your, your double PhD or whatever it is that you have. Yeah? These days people are so over-educated, double PhD, not so uncommon anymore. So, it, but instead of thinking about that, uh, you start to think about the qualities of the heart, uh, about the qualities, how you live in the world, and you identify with that. Uh, and because we like to identify with the things that we feel good about, uh, if you are kind uh, and you feel good about that kindness, it is easy to identify with uh, so this is how you gradually move your identity away from those areas that lead to conflict uh, towards areas that lead to harmony instead. Uh, if you identify with kindness, how are you ever going to have disharmony with anyone? It's almost impossible. If you see someone who is different, yeah, instead of kind of treating them in a bad way because they are different, uh, you have kindness towards them. Uh, you make them join your team. You make people come together. Uh, you make people work together. Uh, and then, of course, harmony arises in society instead. Uh. So if those Burmese Buddhists and some of them were monks. I feel really embarrassed to say monks were saying these kind of things. Yeah, it's really kind of yucky. It's, it's, it's really bad. But if those monks, instead of kind of whipping people up into a frenzy and saying we have to be nationalistic, if they instead said, let's instead identify with the goodness of the Buddhist path, let's identify with the way the Buddha said we should identify, if they had done that instead, there would have been no problems in Burma. There would have been no conflict with the Rohingyas. Uh, instead of treating the Rohingyas badly, they would have supported them. They would have said, please, welcome to our country. Let's live in harmony together. And if you were kind to the Rohingyas, chances are they will be kind in return. Because that's how human beings work. If you treat other people badly, they will treat you badly back because they feel rejected. If you treat people with kindness, wouldn't you react with kindness back again? Isn't this just a natural human thing that when you're treated with kindness, you want to be kind in return? That's just how we work as human beings. And then you create harmony. Then you create something beautiful in the world by living in this way. So this is the first step on this ladder of kind of changing our identity and moving our identity in the right direction, in a direction where it becomes not dangerous and where we live in the world that is much better here. One of the things that I love about our Buddhist society in Perth, and some of you who have been to Perth, I know some of you have been to Perth before, and it's a wonderful thing to see you down there, but one of the things I really love about our Buddhist society is that we have one of the few Buddhist societies almost anywhere in the world that is very unified across all kinds of cultures. When you come 
to an ordinary day in the monastery and you look at the number of people who come to offer food to the monks in the monastery, you find pretty much everything there. You have people with Sri Lankan background, people from Malaysia, Malaysian background, people from Singapore, from China, lots of, lots of the various kind of Chinese background. You have people from Myanmar, you have people from Laos and Cambodia, you have people sometimes from Korea and Japan. Yeah, and of course you also have the locals, the, the kind of the, the Caucasians, yeah, the Westerners who also come to the Buddha society. Everyone comes together here, and everyone works together. And it's such a wonderful thing when that can happen. Here. And uh, we all have the same teacher anyway, he's sitting over there, here, yeah, the Buddha, yeah. So why shouldn't we be able to work together if we have the same teacher, if we have the same thing, the same thing that we are living for in a sense. And that is the right way of thinking here. So, this is how we start out. Now, there is another way of looking at this, and this is one of my favorite suttas. Actually, I have so many favorite suttas, I should stop using that word, because every time I mention a sutta, it's my favorite sutta, so it doesn't really mean very much. Uh, but, um, just, I'll just stop for one second before I... So this particular sutta is uh, found in the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses uh, threes, uh, and this is a sutta has a simile of how it is that we practice the Buddhist path. Uh, and according to the simile, the practice of the Buddhist path is like refining gold. Does anyone know anything about gold refining here? Do we have any gold refiners? Uh, um, among the, no, no gold refiners here today, okay. They're not so common these days anymore, yeah, yeah. That's like in the old days they had gold refiners. But, so this shows us how the purification of the mind, how the development of, of the path is similar to the refinement of gold. So the first thing that is interesting here, which I always like to mention, is that the mind is compared to gold. Yeah, do you know that you have a lump of gold in here? Can you feel that? A lump of gold inside? Why is the mind compared to gold? And the reason is because in the ordinary world, gold is one of the most valuable things in human society. Yeah? Very considered very top of value. And this is true almost anywhere you go in the world. That gold is at the very top. Now the mind is just like that. The mind has a value that is similar to gold. This is the first thing to remember. Yeah, you're carrying gold with you. You thought you wanted gold on the outside when you're carrying all this gold already. It's already there. In fact, the mind is far more valuable than gold. Because the amount of happiness you can get out of gold, how much happiness can you get out of gold? Little bit, yeah, a tiny little bit. Okay, you get some nice jewelry or whatever. You have a nice golden watch or whatever it is. It's kind of cool, yeah, and then you kind of feel feel nice, but it doesn't make you very happy at the end of the day, and then you have to kind of hold on to these things and nobody steals it or whatever. It doesn't make you that happy. But the mind, on the other hand, yeah, has the potential to make you almost infinitely happy in comparison. All happiness ultimately resides in the mind. That's where real happiness is. So the idea is just a simile, is just to show us that the mind is something incredibly valuable by comparing it to gold, even though there isn't any comparison really, because the mind is just so way ahead of everything else. But the other point is, of course, that in the same way that gold isn't really valuable when it has all the defilements, yeah? if you get raw gold coming out of the ground, there's nothing special about it, it doesn't really shine, it's not really brilliant, there's nothing about it which is very interesting. So you have to refine it and you have to purify it before the gold becomes brilliant and beautiful. And it's the same thing with our minds. The reason maybe you don't understand that the mind is like gold because of too many defilements. Yeah, I don't mean to say anything bad about you. <laughs> I really don't, but this is the nature of human beings, yeah? And all of you here are very good people, otherwise you wouldn't be here. What's the point of coming to a Dhamma talk unless you are already inclining in the right direction? So you are good people already. But the point is, even good people, there is still usually plenty of defilements in the mind. And that is why the mind is not so happy. That is why it isn't radiating and shining in the same way as gold is. Uh, so if you want a mind that radiates and shines, uh, it's called the Pabhasara Chitta in Pali. Uh, yeah? If you want that kind of mind, you have to refine it in the same way that you refine gold. Uh, this is interesting, isn't it? So how do you refine gold? Let's start with gold. So if you want to refine gold, 
the way you have to do that is you have to start with the coarse things, the coarse defilements in the gold. Yeah? First of all, you take out the gravel, you take out the sand, yeah? you take out the, kind of the big things that are a problem in that gold. You have to start in the right way. You cannot start with the refined particles. And then once the, core, uh, the coarse particles have been removed, then you can move on to the medium particles, yeah, the medium kind of problems. Then you go to the very refined, like the dust and that sort of thing. You remove the dust from the gold. And eventually you put the gold in the crucible and you heat it over the fire and then you blow away even the most refined problems in that gold. So there's a certain sequence that you have to follow. And if you don't follow the sequence in the right way, you're not going to be able to purify that gold. And uh, it is exactly the same thing with the mind. In the mind, it is a gradual training. And unless you get the gradual training in the right way, unless you start in the right place, you're not going to be able to purify your mind. You have to start with the coarser aspects of your conduct. Yeah? So you ask, am I keeping the five precepts? Okay? If you're not keeping the five precepts yet, I'm not going to ask you. Yeah? Because sometimes people feel a bit, oh, a bit, a bit embarrassed if I ask. So I'm not going to ask. But if you're not keeping them yet, yeah, that is an opportunity for you to start doing something that actually is part of the foundation of the Buddhist path. So you start with that. Then the second step is, well, what about my mind? Can I do something to purify my mind? Yeah? You start with the coarse, coarser aspect. Then you ask yourself, well, what is my next problem? Okay, maybe my temper is a bit strong. How can I reduce my temper a little bit? Yeah? So you do that. And there are very good ways of reducing your temper. It is not that hard. You will be surprised. But the secret teachings on how to reduce your temper happen upstairs. Yeah? So if you're not part of that group, then you lose out this time around. But those teachings are available if you kind of uh, you know, hang around and you will find out. And then you move on to the even more refined defilements of the mind. Yeah? The small things that stop you from attaining good meditation, all of this. And at the very end of this sequence, yeah, as you purify the mind more and more and more, at the very end of this, says the Buddha, this is a teaching from the Buddha, he says, is the very refined defilements of the mind, and these often have to do with identity. Yeah. The Buddha says, your reputation, yeah, your nationality, yeah. what is it, your, 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 your country, your reputation, and your family, I think, yeah. I think those three are the things that he talks about that. All of these th three things obviously have a lot to do with our identity. At the very end of the path, yeah, before you're able to really move into a deep sta state of meditation practice, uh, these are the defilements that you have to give up. Uh. Yeah, so as we move, change our sense of identity, yeah, first of all we identify with the good qualities, uh, then uh, as we move towards deeper meditation practice, uh, we have to give up uh, this sense of who we are completely before we enter deep meditation. Uh. And this is one of the wonderful things about meditation practice. This is one of those very beautiful and powerful things when you meditate. Uh. You will find that very often when you meditate uh, that your mind thinks as anyone who has never been thinking while they meditate. If you have, well done, welcome to the Arahant Club. If you have never, you know, never thought while you... Most people think a little bit when they meditate. And a lot of that thinking, if you start to look at what it is about, is often about expressing yourself. It's about feeling that you exist. It's about maybe uh, thinking about things that happened in the past, or where you want to go in the future. A lot of it has to do with your identity. Some of it has to do with just enjoyment of pleasures of the world, but also a lot of it has to do with identity. The mind wants to express itself. It's becoming a little bit too quiet in there, and you start to feel a bit kind of, oh, you know, it's a bit dodgy. And then you start thinking, basically to express your identity, because you feel ill at ease with being too peaceful and being too quiet. And this is a very important part of why we think in meditation. Uh, so to be able to become really peaceful, you actually have to abandon that identity. Uh, and what you find is that when you abandon the identity, uh, it is so powerful, it is so beautiful. The happiness that arises from giving up your sense of self uh, is far exceeds any happiness that that identity gave you in the first place. Uh, why? Because when you give up your identity, that is when you can become truly peaceful. Not only can you become peaceful, but you start to 
demolish the boundaries between you and other people with other beings in the world. When you go into a deep state of meditation, when your mind is getting really quiet, it doesn't really have to be that deep even, just your mind becoming quiet. Uh, there is no sense there, yet there is no sense of gender anymore. Uh, there is no sense of whether you are a lay person or a monk. Yes, yeah, so when you go deep into meditation, it's as if you are all little monks or little nuns. Uh, isn't that nice? Uh, you don't have to wear funny outfits and shave your head yeah, to become a monk or a nun. All you have to do is go into meditation practice and then we're all the same all of a sudden. It's like you have become a monk in there or you become a nun in there. Isn't that a wonderful way of becoming a monk or a nun? It's the easy way to becoming a monk or nun. Yay, easy way. Everybody wants the easy way. This is, I'm just giving you some t tips here, some, se some secret tips yeah, on how to become the monk and nun the easy way. The identity is disappearing. No gender, no difference between whether you are wealthy or poor, whether you are uneducated or educated, whether you are a Muslim or Christian or a Buddhist, yeah, that, that you have mystics in Christianity and Islam as well who are able to enter deep states of meditation. There's no back difference in background whether you're from this nationality or that nationality or this ethnic group or that ethnic group. All of that is gone. And it is such a beautiful state of mind when all of that is gone. And because you are demolishing the boundaries between people, it means that at this point it is also possible for you to start to feel loving kindness. Uh, loving kindness without boundaries, uh, where you take in everyone in the whole world. Uh, everyone is now, your heart is suddenly open to everybody. Why? Because the boundaries of identity have been completely demolished. Uh, so this is what happens, yeah, as you go through the state of meditation, as you give up the identity that the Buddha is talking about, actually it opens up your heart, it opens up the possibility of loving kindness, of metta, of compassion for the whole world in an entirely new way that you have never seen before. And it's the most marvelous thing that you have ever experienced in your entire life. At this point your mind really starts to become like gold. Yeah, it becomes shining, brilliant and bright. Uh, and you start to understand what real happiness is in this life. Uh, all you had before was just dung in comparison. Uh, now you're starting to understand what happiness is all about. Uh. So, identity is problematic. Identity leads to conflict in our society. Uh, and because our identity is, is problematic, we cannot resolve all the conflict in society. We can maybe help out a little bit. Uh, but what we can do is resolve the conflict inside of ourselves. Because it starts with individual human beings. Uh, and if we can give up the conflict within ourselves, uh, then at the very least we are doing something good for ourselves and the people around us. And sometimes it also spreads into the world. Uh, and the way to do that is, first of all, to move towards identifying, instead of identifying with all of these superficial things, uh, identify instead with the aspects of the spiritual path, uh, with kindness, with morality, with compassion, with understanding. Uh. And as you do that, you take it further and further and further, uh, until eventually you give up the identity completely, uh, and all you have is a sense of metta and kindness for the whole world. Uh. And then is when you take this almost to its highest point. Uh. But then uh, you take it even further. Uh, yeah, then you go even beyond that. And this is where the very most profound aspects of the Buddhist path is. Uh, and this is where you take it to the point of becoming an, a noble person, uh, where you actually get an insight into non-self. Uh, and when you see non-self fully, uh, you understand for the first time why the whole idea of the identity was an illusion in the first place. Uh, there isn't really an identity there. We all were just moving around, fluctuating from one state to the next one. And this feeling that we are something solid, that we have an inherent essence, that we are somebody in this world, actually it was a mistake. And that is the final demolishment of the sense of identity. After that you become like the Buddha. The Buddha is a person who lives in the world and he only lives for one reason out of compassion for everyone else. But his internal identity is completely gone. And that is why the Buddha can teach all of us, uh, because all of us are part of that. Uh, uh, he, he relates to every one of us, because he doesn't have an identity anymore. He can relate to any human being in this world. Uh. So, there you are. I have talked enough. Uh. <laughs> 
So, would you like to ask any questions or comment or say anything or disagree? Yeah, you can disagree with me if you like. If you think I'm talking rubbish, then it's okay. Yeah, yeah I don't really mind it. <laughs> but uh, if you have any comments, this is your chance. I only come to KL once a year, and by the time this year comes around, I might be dead. <laughs> yeah, so who knows? So because of that, this is your opportunity to ask any questions or whatever you like, if you, if you wish. If you don't wish, that's okay as well. In the meantime, I shall have some... Oh, tea, okay, wow. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Brother Lai, that's very kind of you, uh, looking after what's me. Uh, Ajahn, uh, mm. what's the difference between a uh, stream winner who has abandoned identity view versus the Arahan who has abandoned conceit? So what's the difference between okay. these two factors? Sure, yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is one of those uh, questions that often come up in Buddhism. If you know a little bit more about Buddhism, this is kind of the things that come up because it's not entirely clear always. And uh, these two things are very closely related to each other. But the difference is, and the Buddha talks about this, in a, he talks about something called the vipalasas in the sutta. Vipalasa is the distortion of the mind. Uh, yeah, it's like the idea that uh, uh, you feel, you think that there is happiness when actually there is suffering, you feel that something is permanent when actually there is uh, uh, impermanent, all of these kind of things. And the Buddha says, well, these distortions of the mind, they happen in three different areas. Uh, they happen in the area of view, uh, happen in the area of thought, uh, and they happen in the area of perception. Uh, yeah? So these are like three different ways of, uh, if you like, classifying the mind or thinking about the mind. Because the mind has all of these three characteristics. We have views, we have thoughts, and we have perceptions. Uh, now, if you are the place where you can actually gain insight first is in the area of views. Yeah? And the reason for that is because views is like a solid thing that we hold on to. Yeah? Perceptions and thoughts are just habits that often run in the mind, and they are often run in the mind based on the views that we have. And because they are based on the views, the most basic thing we have to abandon first is the wrong view. This always starts with that. And that is why stream entry is the acquisition of right view and the giving up of wrong view. So that is the first, and that is what happens when you become a stream mentor. The view is given up. But the habits from the past yeah, are still very strong. Yeah? And because the habits from the past are so strong, the thinking and the perception still often goes back to the sense of I. Yeah? You think about me and my. You think, Wait, oh, why am I thinking about that? Yeah? The, the stream mentor, oh, my view, I, I, I know that isn't really true, but the habit of the mind is so strong. So it goes in that area. But if you ask a stream mentor, do you kind of believe in identity in a permanent self? Straight away they will say no, because they know the truth, uh, but the habit is so strong. Uh. So the difference between the Arahant and the stream is that Arahant has purified the mind, not just in terms of views, but also in thinking and perception. So ev even that habit of thinking in the wrong way has been purified, yeah? So from now on, the mind never thinks in that wrong way at all anymore. That is the Arahant. Uh, and that is why the Arahant has perfect mindfulness and perfect perfect everything pretty much, yeah, well, not, not per, from a spiritual point of view anyway. That's why the, there's a difference there. Yeah. So that is a, that's a good question here, yeah. and one that comes up in the, in the suttas. How are you, by the way? Are you keeping well? Yeah? Okay, good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Anyone else? No, everyone very happy and content? Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Please feel free to ask simple questions as well. They don't have to be very fancy questions, you know. We, uh, yeah, please. Very um, much, do, do Just now you say that to the, the conflict is because you identify with the identity. Yeah. That, that's uh, the, the main reason. But uh, do you think that in this era, is it possible? Because uh, we, we read from the Sutta as well. Yeah. Uh, even during Buddha's time, you know, uh, even within the Sangha, there's a conflict. Mm. You know, between them, you know, there's a different views. And, 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 and even that era, with yeah. so many Arahan around, and Buddha was still around, and there's, even in the Sangha itself, so that, that, there's a lot of conflict. But in, yeah. in a society like now, where it's hard to find Arahan, yeah. 
Um, and then you have the medias, you know, sensationalize uh, some of the, the, the news, uh, even the, the hostility toward the Muslim. And I understand that some of them, because of the history, were written in such a way that, you know, um, if you go to India, you see a lot of, like, those Nalanda University, all those, uh, the, all, all those Buddhist sites were actually mostly uh, destroyed. Mm. So I think it was written, I think it was somehow it's just highlighted it's a Muslim who actually invaded and destroyed it. Yeah. So that's, deep down, there's always this fear toward the, the Muslim, yeah. you know. Yeah, and then, yeah. or, of course, yeah. the way they practice yeah. the religion, so they tend to, like, destroy yeah. other people's uh, places of worship. So that deep down there always this fear, and then um, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, the the point is that even in Buddha's era, there's there, there's there's still a conflict even between the Sangha itself. Yeah. I mean, in the modern society with the media, you know, uh, yeah. that it's even harder to to to, to, yeah. to practice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you. I, uh, they, I, there's a lot of things to be said about this, and I I think one of the things that you have to be careful also about Buddhist propaganda because Buddhists too we have our kind of blind spots, you know, and we tend to think that, uh, we tend to kind of elevate Buddhism and think that Buddhism, and, and Buddhism can be very good, yeah, but sometimes Buddhism also tends to deteriorate and becomes a bit murky and bad. And one of the things to know about Buddhist history is that it is true that the Muslim invasions in India were very brutal and very harsh and they kind of knocked out what was left of Buddhism. But what is often not pointed out, and I think is a very important part of this, is that Buddhism was already very corrupt by the time uh, it er the, the Muslims arrived in India. It had gone through a period of becoming more into tantric things, yeah, and kind of where you kind of involved all the sensual stuff within the Buddhist practice. Uh, there was a period of time where Hinduism had a very strong impact on Buddhism. Uh, there was a development of Mahayana ideas and all of these things, uh, which sometimes are good, sometimes not so good. Uh, and the development of uh, Theravada ideas, sometimes good, not sometimes not so good. But Buddhism had already deteriorated a lot and was much less of a force in India. The kind of the glory days of Buddhism in India was roughly from the time of Ashoka and onwards for maybe 500 years. At that time, Buddhism was probably the strongest religion in all of India, even greater than Buddhism. And then it started to deteriorate. It always happens. You get too much support, too much money, too many kings worshipping you. What happens? You, 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 you become corrupt. Yeah, This is human nature. We become corrupt when there's too much. You see this now in the, in the world. You see... The forest tradition in Thailand was very, very strong maybe 50 years ago. Some of the great forest masks in Thailand, Mary Ar Arahant's coming out of that. Uh, and then they too get too much support. And you go there now, it is no longer the same yeah, as it was 50 years ago. There is decline. So sometimes the best thing for Buddhism is to be a minority religion. Yeah, is to be ordinary people supporting it, not the kings and the wealthy people, because that is where corruption often comes in. Everybody wants to support the best. That's why everyone supports the arahants and the powerful people. And there are some very, still some very impressive monks in Thailand. I went to visit one of these very impressive monks just recently. That was back in December. The monk called Ajahn Ganha, and uh, he, is, he is very, very uh, impressive. And I, you come into the presence of a monk like that, it's like you feel a bit kind of, in, straight away, you're a little bit nervous, yeah, because you, this monk, there's no doubt, much doubt that he can, well, you think he can read your mind anyway. It's very hard to know these things. That's what it felt like when I was there. Yeah. But uh, he's so kind, he's so gentle, yeah, you start to relax very quickly in, in the presence of people like that. But anyway, my main point is just that. Peop these people still do exist in the world today. Yeah. So we have to be careful to lay all the burdens of history on the shoulders of the Muslims. Uh, very often it is things internal to, to Buddhism that were far, far worse for Buddhism than the Muslims were. If Buddhism had still been strong, the Muslims wouldn't have been able to throw it over like that. Hindu society continued. Hindu society wasn't overthrown. Yeah? Christian society continued in many places. Buddhism was the only thing that was destroyed completely. There must have been some internal problem in Buddhism already. Yeah? It's a very important part of the story. Yeah? So. Um, uh, so yes, people are afraid of Islam, but uh, again, the way to secure Buddhism in the future is always to live the Buddhist way. Uh, if one of the things that came out of what happened in Burma was that, yes, I understand the Burmese are afraid, and of course, they deserve compassion for that, uh, but what comes out of the way things were done in Burma, it 
drags down the name of Buddhism around the world. Uh, yeah? uh, big headlines in Time magazine in the US, one of the largest magazines in the world, uh, the Buddhist face of evil, and then a picture of monk on the, on the front cover. Uh, remember that one? Uh, yeah, that was a few years ago. And very bad for Buddhism. Yeah? You really kind of dragging down the Buddhism. Everybody thinks that Buddhism is actually just as bad as everyone else when you read that. And maybe we are in a certain way, because we're just human beings. We're all human beings in a certain way. Uh, so this is the first thing I would say. The other thing I would say about what you were talking about, the idea of, yes, at the time of the Buddha there were more Arahants around uh, and they still had conflicts, uh, but uh, remember the Arahants were confined to a very small group in society. Uh, at the time of the Buddha, uh, Buddhism was still very weak. Uh, the strong religions then was probably, well, Brahmanism, yeah, the precursor to Hinduism. Jainism was also probably quite strong at that time because it existed prior to Buddhism in ancient India. So the Arahants were kind of confined to a small subgroup of society. Yeah. And I don't know if uh, society at large was very impacted by these Arahants. Yeah. Society at large may pretty much have been continued as pretty much as before and, and afterwards. Uh, so I don't know if we can use that excuse in the present day. Yeah? There are no Arahants around, so that we can sort of, you know, it's natural that we fight more and all these kind of things. Uh, I don't think we should think like that, because if we think like that, uh, it's almost as if we have already given up, uh, in a sense. Yeah? You give up, you say, well, okay, we don't have the support of the Arahants, so we have a real problem. Uh, I think that's the wrong way of thinking here. Uh, I think that uh, we can, if we are wise, yeah? wisdom comes in so many different areas. There is the spiritual wisdom, but then there is the worldly wisdom as well. If you look around the world, you see there are certain societies that are better functioning than other societies. The United Nations often tries to classify societies according to certain things. They call the, the Human Development Index and these kind of things that the United Nations publishes. And I don't know how good those indexes are, but if you if we assume that there is some truth to those indices, uh, then you can see that there are certain societies that tend to score higher than others. Uh, and some of the societies happen to be the country where I come from. Yeah, usually scores quite high, high on that index. Uh, yeah, you, almost usually the top five or sometimes the very top. Uh, and there's no Buddhism in Norway. There's no Arahants in Norway. Not a single one. Uh, and so there's just polar bears and snow. Uh, yeah, actually the polar bears are towards the top. Uh, and yet, somehow, they have managed yeah, to create a good society. Yeah. So my point is that arrogance, maybe, maybe not. Yeah? Uh, sometimes we can do these things uh, despite uh, the lack of these things, uh, despite the, the absence of these things. Uh, so we shouldn't kind of assume that we cannot do the right thing just because there aren't arrogance. It's up to us. Uh, there's different kinds of, of wisdom in the world. There's spiritual wisdom, but then there is worldly wisdom as well. Uh, and these two things don't always go together. Uh. Okay with that? Uh, yeah? <laughs> okay. Where are you? Ah, yes, please, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Simple questions, simple questions are great, so go for it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Or are we just are we, are we living life? Are we actually just? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Yeah. yeah. Are yeah. we just existing? Yeah. Or is it better to live life? Okay. Because I I I look around and yeah. I see people just existing. Yeah. Okay. And I see people living life. Yeah. So of course, living life um, yeah. will make your life more enjoyable. Mm. Uh, yet there will of course be craving etc yeah. because you want to live life enjoying life mm. that there are people who just come into this world and they just exist yeah and now I see what you, you mean you know yeah. what I mean now like, I know what like you mean I, yeah. I think yeah. I'm yeah. trying to just exist now yeah. <laughs> just like surviving yeah. basically yeah, I, I yeah, mean yeah, like yeah. just drift yeah. on yeah you know from yeah. the day I was born till the day yeah. I die I just exist yeah. yeah or is it better if I come into this world yeah. and I live life yeah. like if I can to the fullest yeah but that would mean actually a lot of suffering, right? <laughs> because maybe no, we, no, not necessarily. You see, this is the thing. I think this is a misunderstanding sometimes. And I, I would say to you, live life. Yeah, absolutely, live life. That's what I say. Don't. 
Sometimes I think Buddhists can become too serious. Uh, yeah, they become super duper serious uh, and they look very miserable and sad and they kind of they keeping too many precepts, not enjoying themselves, anything like this. But that is not really what Buddhism is about. Uh, there's nothing wrong with enjoying yourself. There's nothing wrong with, you know, with enjoying some good entertainment sometimes, having nice food, having good relationships and all of these kind of things. This is part and parcel of what it means to be a human being. Yes, it gives rise to craving, but if you try to suppress all of these things too much, it still gives rise to craving because it's trying to suppress it. It's just that you can't see it so much on the outside. In the mind, it's even stronger maybe because you, you're trying to hold it back. Yeah. So Buddhism is not really about that. Buddhism is about putting boundaries on your craving. Yeah? If you keep the five precepts, you have constraints, you have a limit to where you can enjoy yourself, what you can do. You cannot steal. But you probably don't want to steal anyway, so it's probably okay. You, would you like to steal? Not really. Yeah? So even if stealing or cheating somebody might be able to kind of give you an advantage sometimes, you don't really want to go there. You know it's bad. Uh, or, uh, you know, so there are certain things you cannot do, and that is the restraint that you need on the Buddhist path. So we need to understand what the problem is with sensual pleasures. The problem with sensual pleasures and living life, as you say, the problem is that we tend to take it too far. We live life a little bit too much. Yeah? We don't care about how we affect other people. That is where the problem arises. But you can enjoy a lot within the parameters of what is allowable, yeah? or what is okay from and still be kind and still be compassionate and caring of other people. So you want to join those two things. If you want to live a good life as a Buddhist, join, look after yourself. Yeah, spend, as the says in the suttas, the wise person, they spend their wealth on themselves. Look after yourself. It's okay to spend money on yourself. Then, when you have spent money on yourself, you spend money on your family, the people who are closest to you. Then you spend money on... Uh, uh, you can do the broader, larger family, people who are maybe, whoever, whatever relationship there are with you. And according to the suttas, also good to give, you give a little bit also to religious purposes. Yeah? In the suttas specifically talk about samanas and ascetics, ascetic people. Uh, so you find that balance in life and you save a certain amount as well. So you live wisely in this way. But number one is to look after yourself with your wealth, with your money. This is specifically said by the Buddha in the suttas. If you want to look it up, go to the Sigalovada Sutta in the Long Discourse of the Buddha, number 31. Is that right? 31? Oh, I think it's 31. I, oh, I'm getting confused now, getting too old. I'm probably getting too old. That's the problem. I used to know all of these things. Yeah. But, um, so you should have invited me to Malaysia 10 years ago, 15 years ago. That would have been much more clear. But anyway, so... You go there, and the Buddha specifically says these things. So it's about using these things in the right way. I would recommend, if we don't allow Buddhists to enjoy themselves, Buddhism is going to die out, because you have to, people have to enjoy themselves. If you look at how the Buddhists lived at the time of the Buddha, ordinary Buddhist people, they enjoyed themselves. They weren't too serious about the practice. They found a balance in life. And this is so important. And then, as you practice the Buddhist path, the spiritual path, yeah, then what happens is that you, the deeper you take it, the less interested you are in the material things of the world, the less interested you are in the sensual pleasures. Why? Because you have an inner happiness that is far greater. That is the point of the spiritual path. The spiritual path is not to avoid happiness. The spiritual path is to discover real happiness inside, the deeper kind of happiness. And that is why the spiritual path is so beautiful and so profound, because it gives rise to something far more meaningful than you can find in ordinary life. So go naturally. Go with the flow. Don't force yourself to suffer some more. Live. Yeah, live life. Don't just exist. Live life to the full. And then you'll be good. And then you'll be happy. That's what I would recommend. Otherwise, we're going to die out as Buddhism. Just bang like that. There will be no more Buddhism in the world. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I hope you're okay with that. Bante, yes. Hello. Bante, Please. Uh, good morning. I think your good last morning. few... Yeah. Your last few... Uh, Command is very valid. So what basically I'm saying is that we as a Putujana, of course, I, what you teach about identity at the higher level, at Aryahan level, or at uh, Bante's level, it may be. As a Putujana, in this very imperfect world, uh, imperfect world, how uh, is it the, the, uh, the nature of the teaching of the Buddha is in such a way that we have to be a minority 
a religion to be comfortable <laughs> means that we only operate at our personal level. Forget about the higher level, which is because what I always call it sometimes that we have to have a defensive kind of identity in the sense that like you gave a very good example in Burma. While you try to have kindness and develop all the good virtue, the external factors are giving you hell. If I'm not mistaken, uh, even in Burma, is the Muslim. Of course, like you say, they are good Muslims. <laughs> but if they keep killing you and this kind of thing, uh, how, how, how as a lower level Buddhist, we put to jhana, how do we uh, respond? Yeah. We cannot be uh, quietly, you know. Of course, in the very developed mm. country like in Australia or in Europe, probably the environment is so conducive that you can operate very comfortably because they give you the much freedom. Let's say you operate, you are in the very oppressive kind of society, in Middle East and all this kind, when mm. they start mm. prosecuting you, killing you. Mm. So we as the Putujana, how do we operate? <laughs> you know, to in order yeah. to be yeah. comfortable and in order to have the right environment to develop our, ourselves to go up to a higher level. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, uh, I, I th personally, I, I don't normally, I think it's very rare for uh, Muslims to really oppress Buddhists as such. I don't think it is that common. I think in reality, uh, you don't find it very often. I mean, I have been to the Middle East. I was in, uh, in the, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, just recently giving a talk. Yeah, I gave a talk there. It was no problem. In fact, in the UAE, it was more open than here in Malaysia. In the UAE, you can give a talk to a, gen a general audience. Muslims, everyone is allowed to come in, no problem. Yeah? Yeah. It's actually more, more kind of less restrictive than even here, right here in Malaysia. So, uh, and if you go to Indonesia, it's the same. Yeah, you can get any anyone can come into the crowd. It's a very much it's a more open society in that way. So it is not always as bad as it may seem. Yeah, it really depends. And uh, I think that uh, in the in the long run, even if you do sometimes maybe come across people of another religion who are difficult, yeah, and who are, uh, it, it may happen sometimes. Uh, the right response. Uh, in my mind, is always to be kind back. And not to, you don't need to defend yourself. The best defense is actually kindness. Uh, okay, then maybe there is an extreme situation. Let's say that some, someone actually does attack you. Let's say someone attacks you and they want to kill you. What do you do? Well, if that really happens, I don't think it's ever going to happen, so it's a very, very theoretical question. But if it were to happen, and if you were to defend yourself physically in that sort of situation, I don't think it would be a big deal. Yeah? It's not very bad karma, because you're only doing it in self-defense. Uh, you may get a bit hot, a bit aggressive or whatever. It's not really a bad thing. You're doing it in, at the last resort. Uh, and this is the idea that karma is very flexible and variable thing. It depends on all kind of motivations and intentions, what kind of karma you are making. Yeah? So whether you are doing it in self-defense or you are aggressively pursuing someone else, very, very different things in society. So if that should happen, I wouldn't be too concerned if you have to defend yourself, yeah? as you say, as a Putujana, as an ordinary person. Yeah? But generally speaking, kindness goes a long, long way in society. Yeah? I have found when I'm kind to people, people tend to be kind back. Yeah? Yeah. And the people who get in trouble in the world are usually people who are already a little bit aggressive on the aggressive side. Yeah? They are often the ones who get into trouble. And if you, let's say that you are really kind, yeah? and someone still decides to kill you. Sometimes that may happen, yeah? It is very unlikely, but let's say it happens. It's not such a big deal. <laughs> because if you die with a good heart, nothing bad is going to happen to you, yeah? You will be fine. You will die, then you go on and you carry on afterwards. You carry on with your Buddhist practice in a nice big mansion in the heavenly realm or something like that. <laughs> you'll be okay. It is the other person that has the problem. It's the other person who's going to go to a bad rebirth or whatever, you're okay. So I say, even if the very worst were to happen, actually, it is not so bad. So the problem is the fear of death. We are far too afraid of death. Death isn't that dangerous. If you have a good heart, death is often a nice, something very pleasant and very happy prospect. You're getting rid of a body, which especially if you're very old and sick, getting rid of this old body, okay, now move on to something better. <laughs> So it's Thank all you. about perspective, yeah, and thinking Thank the right you, way. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> So um, all of us have a different identity, right? Like as a gender or at work, you know, and even at home, you have different roles to play in the family. So how do you strike a balance between responsibility and letting go of identity? Responsibility and letting go of identity. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the idea, you, you don't actually necessarily have to let go of responsibility because you, have an, uh, because you don't have an identity, yeah? you can still, have, still be responsible. The Buddha was very responsible, he looked after the Sangha, looked after the monks, uh, and sometimes the Buddha would do amazing things of care for his monastic community. Uh, there's a very famous story in the suttas, which, I, which is so, such a beautiful story, this is uh, uh, the Buddha uh, is walking around the monastery. Sometimes he would just walk around the monastery and he would inspect all the huts and he would have a chat with the monks, yeah? usually not the nuns because the nuns were a little bit uh, further away, but with the monks. Uh, and then one day, according to this story in the suttas, uh, he would come to this monk and this monk had dysentery. Huh? You know dysentery? Yeah, dysentery is like, you know, kind of you, you, you have no control over your bodily functions anymore, yeah? and everything kind of flows out of you, and you are really filthy, and it's really terrible, and really, really awful. Huh? So he came to this monk's hut, and everything was really filthy, and he asked his monk, What's, what, what, what is wrong with you? Huh? Oh, I have got dysentery. Yeah, it was really, really filthy. And then the Buddha said, Well, haven't you got a nurse? And he says, No, I haven't got a nurse. Well, how come you haven't got a nurse? And he said, Well, because I don't do anything for the other monks, they don't do anything for me. <laughs> the Buddha was not too pleased with that, with that, that yeah? because this is the wrong way of thinking. Yeah? Just because someone else doesn't do anything for you doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything for them. Huh? So, um, this, what the Buddha does then, huh? yeah, he says to Venerable Ananda, go and fetch some water. Huh? And then the two of them, they clean up this monk, and it's filthy, you can imagine, really, really filthy. They clean him up, put on new robes. The Buddha, the Buddha and Venerable Ananda grab this monk and lift him up and put him on the bed afterwards. This is the Buddha. Yeah, isn't that amazing? So just because you have no sense of self, just because you have no identity, doesn't mean you don't have any kindness or sense of responsibility. And then the Buddha afterwards, he goes out to the monks and he asks them, well, this monk in the kuti there, how come he doesn't have any nurse? And the monks say, well, because he doesn't do anything for us, we don't do anything for him. Yeah? And the Buddha is not too pleased and he says, it doesn't matter, you have no mother and father to look after you. And then he says, whoever would like, whoever would look after me should also look after his fellow monk or fellow monastic. Yeah? Yeah, it's such a beautiful saying, and uh, it shows you that we should care, so you should always care. In fact, your ability to care often increases when you have less identity, yeah? because often your identity may be challenged. Yeah? If you are a, a parent, for example, and your children don't behave properly, yeah, that happens, every parent has that problem, yeah? every parent, are you a parent? No, not a parent, okay, good. So. <laughs> So, but we, you have an, I have, I also am not a parent, I have no idea what parents is like, but I can imagine a little bit what it might be like. It's probably much more difficult than I can imagine, but still I have some idea. If your children don't behave properly, okay, initially you are patient, yeah? But on the 10th time you start to lose your patience, yeah? And that is where, and, and one of the reasons why you lose your patience is because you feel that your authority is being challenged. And that authority has to do with your identity, who you are as a parent. And then, because your child is not listening to you. So actually your identity can be undermine your ability to be kind to this child, yeah? Precisely because of identity. So I think identity actually, it means that you are less challenged in the world. People don't, other people cannot push your buttons so easily. So you have more ability to just stay even and to stay calm and to react wisely in all kinds of situations. So I, think, I don't think there is any opposition between lack of identity and uh, being responsible and doing the right thing. Often I think, in fact, uh, it goes together instead. Uh. It's very interesting in our, in our monastery in Perth. Uh, I, is there anyone here who has never heard of Ajahn Brahm? It's, oh, it's very hard to find anyone who hasn't heard of Ajahn Brahm these days. But, uh, so Ajahn Brahm is the abbot of our monastery, yeah? And he is like the most irresponsible abbot from one point of view. Uh, because he doesn't say anything, yeah? People do weird things, he, doesn't, he often, often doesn't say anything at all. And yet, despite the fact that Ajahn Brahm doesn't say anything, probably our monastery in Perth is one of the most 
harmonious monasteries around. Yeah? And part of the reason is because everyone realizes it's, it's my personal responsibility to create harmony in this monastery. Ajahn Brahm is not going to do anything. Yeah? He's just going to look and say, oh yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, do. <laughs> and in that way, yeah, things work out. There was another example. This was uh, Ajahn Lim. Ajahn Lim, very famous monk in Thailand. He's now the abbot of Wat Papong. He took o over after Ajahn Cha at yeah, that monastery. And uh, uh, someone once asked him, well, you know, how do you deal with all these monks in the monastery? Yeah, so much trouble, right? He said, no, no trouble at all. What do you mean, no trouble? Yeah, so many people to look after, you have to control them. No, no, the, the, kind of the, the monks in the monastery, they just do whatever they want, and I just kind of observe and watch. There's no problem for me, yeah? <laughs> this is Ajahn Liam's idea, yeah? You don't get involved, just allow things to go. You don't worry too much about them. And uh, one, another example, this is the same Ajahn Liam, and this is one of the reasons why he gets so famous and why he's, some people say he might be an arahant even. And uh, this was when they had a, uh, Ajahn Shah's cremation. Yeah? This was in 1992 or something like that. And they had built this stupa. They were going to cremate him inside the stupa. And I think Ajahn Liam had been one of the builders. Yeah? He had been one of the builders of the stupa. And so they had this... Um, cremation coffin, an iron coffin, put in the middle of the stupa, and then they were going to burn it inside the stupa. And then it went wrong, yeah? They started to burn, and then the flames kind of went wrong, and the, 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 kind of the, the coffin opened up, and the whole structure started to kind of be wobbly. Everything was going really, really bad. So Ajahn Liam, he looked at it and said, oh yeah, I don't know, whatever, I'm going to go back and have a rest. <laughs> So he went back to his cutie and lay down and had a snooze, yeah? And somebody else can deal with the problem. Even though he had built, he had built the thing here. And this is the nice thing about Arahans. Yeah, okay, I don't know what to do now, so I'm just going to let, leave it, let it be, yeah? I'm not going to worry about it, uh, leave it. That may, may sound irresponsible from one point of view, but maybe at that time it was the right thing to do. Uh, maybe he didn't know what to do, yeah? So, okay, whatever, I'm going to let it be. I've tried my very best. Uh, this is kind of the cool thing about people who are really spiritually advanced, that do things that you don't expect them to do. They do things out of the ordinary, yeah? And it kind of opens your eyes. Think, Whoa, <laughs> this is very interesting, yeah? So uh, anyway, this is just some of those, those little stories. I actually, I, I told her, uh, this is another story, which is really nice. I told it yesterday to the people on the retreat upstairs, and it's a story which I found very interesting. And one of the things that kind of make Ajahn Brahm such a special person in my eyes as well, eh? And uh, you know him very well, you know some of his qualities. But one of the things he, he told me about, this was before I came to the monastery in Perth. Uh, I've only been there for 25 years. I'm still just a kind of whippersnapper in that monastery. But in 1991, uh, they had a big wildfire yeah, coming through the monastery. You have seen the wildfires recently in Australia. Really, really bad. Australia is one of the countries in the world most prone to these kind of wildfires. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1991 was the hottest day on record in Australia, 46 something degrees. Yeah, how, how, what is the hottest in KL? 45. Okay, so okay, so you know you have a little bit of idea. <laughs> not that, not that hot. Yeah, yeah. So really, really super duper hot. And this was towards the end of the hot seasons. So it had been dry for a very long time, and because it had been dry for a very long time, everything is kind of ready to combust. It was very high winds as well, and high winds propelled the flames yeah, in the forest. So on this day, which was just about the worst day in history in WA for fire conditions, uh, there was a fire. It was coming from the south, the wind was going towards the north, it was coming towards the monastery. Yeah. And the fire brigade was there, and the fire brigade was, uh, uh, eventually the fire brigade sort of panicked, uh, and Ajahn Brahm originally wanted to stay in the monastery, but they say everyone has to evacuate, yeah? So they evacuate everybody. Yeah? And the moment they evacuate everyone, the flames start to come into the monastery. Yeah? And Ajahn Brahm, he said he could see those flames. Yeah? And it was like trees exploding. Yeah? And the reason why it is like trees exploding is because the fire is so hot. Yeah? And the eucalyptus leaves in Australia are so full of oil, yeah, that when the flames come and the wind propels forward, the whole tree, bang, goes up in flames. And the wind takes on to the next tree, and the next tree goes bang. Even if there's a big gap between the trees, they all explode like that because the conditions are so bad. It looked like from the hell realms, yeah, it was just so bad. And I saw the pictures afterwards of what it looked like. It looked like the moon. 
It's true, it, it still had some trunks of trees. The trees were still standing, here, but there was no greenery anywhere. The ground was completely grey and brown. The trees had not, nothing green on them. It looked like some kind of moon landscape. It looked terrible. It looked like a place you never wanted to live. And so Ajahn Brahm told me, yeah, so we left the monastery here. And at that time, he told me that I left the monastery, I thought it's all going to burn down. Everything will be gone. At that point, when this was happening, Ajahn Brahm had just spent the previous eight years working every day from seven in the morning to seven in the evening. Yeah, Actually, you were there, weren't you, yesterday? So you know the story already. So seven in the morning to seven in the evening, Yeah, day after day for eight years, working so hard on this particular project, putting his whole life into this. Everything he had done was building up the monastery, and now everything was going to get burnt up. He was sure the monastery was going to burn down. How would you feel if your life's work, if you spent almost 10 hours a day for 8 years constantly working on something, building it up, making a beautiful place, a large hall, all the kutis, the dana sala, all of these things, and now it's all going to go up into flames. How would you feel? Would you say, oh yeah, whatever. Is that what you would say? Or would you say, oh no, my life's work is going up into flames. Most people would be devastated. Yeah? If you look at some of the houses in Australia that have been burnt in these fires, and families are so devastated by the fires because everything in their life has been destroyed. Their whole house with all their belongings inside, everything has burned up. And people are kind of crying and despairing and feeling terrible because their whole life has been turned up. But not Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? His whole life's work was about to go. And then at the moment when everything was about to burn, he told me, well, what I thought at that point was, well, tomorrow, if it is all gone, I will come back and I will start from scratch. Yeah. How is that possible? How can you think that straight away without even, oh yeah, no grief, just okay, tomorrow I'll come back, I'll start from scratch. How is that possible? It shows you someone whose mind is very developed. Yeah? You can only do that if you have a very developed mind. And the reason you can say that, I actually asked Ajahn Brahm, how could you do that? And he said, the reason I could do that, he told me, is because when I work, when I put all that effort into building the monastery here, I was never looking to the result. Yeah, I would, I it really didn't matter what the result was. Okay, the result happened to be that I got a nice monastery, but that wasn't why I was building it. I wasn't building it to make a nice monastery. I was building it because I was doing what is right. I was building it because I was doing an act of generosity, an act of compassion for the world. That is why I was doing it. I was doing it as part of my practice. Yeah, and because the process had been right because he had been doing it purely for reasons of what is Dhamma points and not to gain a certain result. It didn't matter if it burned down because that generosity would still be with him. It would still be in his heart. It would still carry on into the future. And if he were to start on the following day building it up again, it would just be more generosity. Yeah, so no problem. So what this shows us is that when we do things in this world, we don't do things for the results. This is a very high standard, yeah? It's very difficult to get to this point. Uh, but we, ideally, we don't do things for the results. Uh, we do things for the process. Uh, we make sure the process go ro goes right. Uh, we do things because we know it's good to be generous, uh, because it's, you know, we know it's good to be kind, we know it's good to be compassionate. That's why we do things. Uh, and then we can never lose. Why? Because if the result happens, fine. If the result doesn't happen, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant, yeah, because the process has been right. So if you, too, do the same thing, if you focus on the process in your life rather than focus on the results, you can never really be disappointed here because you have practiced the Dhamma, you have done the right thing, and disappointment can never really happen here. In reality, you are still going to be disappointed, yeah, unless you practice a long, long way on the path. But it is a beautiful way of thinking about life. Everything in life, you make it into the process, rather make it into results. And then you will have a long, happy life as a Buddhist. Maybe many happy lives in the future as well. Can you do that, do you think? At least you can move in that direction, yeah? You can do a little bit of that, and then you'll be on the right track, yeah. Okay, so I don't know what to do next, so if you have any more questions, I'm happy. Just tell me when I have to go, uh, Bobby, yeah, you're the boss, so just tell me what to do. <laughs>
Anyone else want to say anything here? Everyone, everyone happy? Everyone? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. So maybe we can just... Uh, maybe that's enough then, Bobby? Yeah? Yeah. Sharing a marriage? Sure, sharing a marriage, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, share the merits together yeah. and uh, remember the departed and share that with them. It's always a nice thing to do. Yeah. So let's do that as a last thing. Edang men yatinang hortu sukita hontu nyatayo. Edang men yatinang hortu Sukita hantu nyatayo, edang me nyatinang hantu. Sukita hantu nyatayo.